This is the season and the cycle in the lectionary of what some call the extraordinary prophets, the little prophets that you find at the back of the Old Testament that nobody really pays much attention to, Micah and Zephaniah and Haggai and all of those. And, and prophets are all well and good, and we've heard from them this Advent season. Some of them are confident, and some are clamoring. Some would chastise us. Some are yearning for something better. But all of them are men. Now, there's nothing wrong with that in and of itself. It is a reflection of the cultures that combined to shape and create what we call scripture. But we would do well to remember that the most significant events in the Christian calendar are first experienced by women. All of them. Women stay till the bitter end at Jesus' cross. Women are the first to arrive to find the tomb empty. Women have the first encounter with the risen Jesus. So maybe, just maybe, it's worth listening to the women at Christmas, too. Yes, don't worry. On Friday, we'll hear the angels' song and the shepherds' proclamation and all of that. But let us truly hear the women today, the women who are most directly affected by what is happening, women who are literally swelled with expectation, because isn't that what pregnancy does? Listen to these life bearers as they consider how their children might influence the world a world laden with care and burdened by pain and oppression, by injustice and tyranny, then and now. Listen to them. Elizabeth, surprised in her old age by a gift of new life, is one who knows. And for all her youth, Mary knows We didn't get to read Mary's reaction to that visitation from Gabriel that comes a little bit earlier in the first chapter of Luke's gospel. We, We sang it instead in hymn 156 about an angelic visitation that confirms what Mary surely knew, that she was carrying a child, but a reminder that this child will be special. And the vision says to the visionary, blessed are you among women. Favored one. Your your child will be a gift from God. And Mary, the visionary, says to that vision, let it be according to your word. That should tell us that Mary is worth listening to. This, This young woman whose condition puts her at under suspicion married or not, a person whose gender renders her voiceless in her own time, and yet she will not stay silent even in the presence of a divine messenger. And this morning we read of her reunion with Elizabeth. This is a meeting of two powerful people, each carrying life within them, each being bold about how that life will change the lives of others. Elizabeth talks briefly, I'll grant you, about endurance and perseverance, about the promises that will come. Mary, Mary, who sings another song, which Pamela and I will sing in a moment, Mary has the nerve to imagine that she and God are partners in the liberation of creation. When I read these texts any time of the year, but especially at Christmas, I find myself wondering what 
it would be like if the Gospels had been written by women, or at least been more widely representative of women. There are women here and there in the gospel story, and it's amazing that they appear, given the cultural uh, realities of the day. What is stunning is that the author of Luke's gospel gives these two women a platform at the beginning of his enterprise. Two pregnant women. One well advanced in her years and another whose life is just beginning, and they're drawn together by that shared condition And instead of girl talk, if you'll pardon the expression, they speak like revolutionaries. Both have had heavenly encounters. Both will see lives changed because of their children. And they imagine even more. Mary is given a song to sing that should put the fear of God into anyone who imagines that they are powerful or rich, or successful, or satisfied. And Elizabeth honors Mary in the passage that Pearl shared with us as the mother of my Lord. And while we don't hear it that way now, in that time and place, that was treasonous talk. Elizabeth had a king and lord And it wasn't the child in Mary's womb. But Elizabeth says it is. Treasonous talk. Earth-shaking talk. And how often are we willing to listen to women's voices when they cry for change? I'm sad to say not very often even in the 21st century. Now, maybe, maybe that's why Luke gave these words to women. Maybe he thought it would be easier for us to dismiss them. Because even now, powerful people dismiss this kind of thing when it comes from the wrong place. When it comes from a woman, a pregnant woman. Hormones, we say, as if the powerful, world-altering act of giving birth was not a threat. It's a threat. In Luke's gospel, it's a threat. And these women speak out of a love and determination that is hard to quantify. And Mary will demonstrate that love from the beginning of the gospel to the very end. The first to celebrate Jesus' birth, and she offers copious tears at his death, and all along the journey, she is there, witnessing, worrying, wondering with with the rest of the disciples what will happen next, and waiting for what she knows should happen. Waiting for the signs that the power structure is coming undone. Waiting for the triumph of the oppressed for the justice that has been promised, for the liberating moment of love and grace that she has always known was just around the corner. We should listen to the women in this story because they know things that we don't. They trust in God with an alarming abandon that makes them both powerful and beautiful. The women, the women are the first evangelists and the first of the lowly to recognize that God's promised deliverance is a gift of and for life, of and for the here and now. And while in this morning's reading they only talk about possibilities, tomorrow, we will discover that the new life they welcome into the world brings new life to all. The visionary gives birth to a teacher of truth, and that truth, grace, and love he brings still threatens the powerful 
and empowers those who are at the mercy of the merciless. And the women know this. This Christmas story is a story of Jesus' birth. But it's told by women first, whose voices seemed insignificant at the time, yet still they gained a power that means we still share their words today. We dismiss, even now, the voices of the outcast, of women, the poor, the other. We dismiss those voices at our peril. For God has an affinity for those who aren't being heard. The wild-eyed prophet, a woman thought to be barren and thus past her usefulness, a young single mother, these are the kind of people that God partners with. These are the agents of heaven-sent change. Maybe we should listen more closely to their echoes in our own time. And if we do, don't be surprised if the world comes undone so that God can make it new.